Greetings to, to everyone this morning. Greetings to you if you are uh, listening from home or listening online. And a uh, very warm welcome to you if you're visiting as well. We're delighted to have you to have you with us as we worship God on uh, what is uh, Palm Sunday. Uh, Psalm 136 and verse 1 says this, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures always. Let's worship the same God. Here is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. When the Prince of Peace, our ransom, shed for us His precious blood. This time of the year, we, uh, we, we think of redemption, that great uh, act of rescue, God rescuing a broken and fallen world by sending His Son, Jesus Christ, into the world uh, to die for us. And so this uh, song, this hymn, reminds us of uh, the motivation behind that rescue plan, the love of God. Here is love vast as the ocean. It's a love that we cannot even fathom. Loving kindness as the flood. When the Prince of Life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood. Shall we sing to God's praise? Let's stand if we're able to and sing to God's praise. Thank you. Let's um, 
some chairs in the front here. Friends, let's bow our heads and pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the love that uh, motivated that great rescue plan more than 2,000 years ago. Indeed, Lord, that plan which uh, was hatched in heaven um, in eternity past. This morning, Father, we we're so sorry that we have sought love in different uh, areas uh, in our lives. Uh, we've sought love from um, the, the relationships that we have. We've sought love with the things that we have, with material things, with uh, consumerism, with buying. Uh, we've sought meaning and we've sought purpose in everything other than uh, where truth actually lies in your being. We've sought love in everything, uh, but the one who is the author of love, the one who is love, um, and we are so sorry that we've sought after the idols that so consume our lives. Lord, forgive us this morning. Uh, we pray for our sins of omission and sins of commission. We rejoice this morning uh, at the, the love that you show to us on the cross. We rejoice that our Redeemer lives. Uh, we rejoice uh, that Jesus is alive, that our Savior has defeated death and is alive and reigns and is on the throne. Uh, we thank you so much for that. Thank you for this Sunday morning. Thank you for um, bringing us here together. We're not here by chance or some sort of random coincidence, a, a, bunch, of, a bunch of cells randomly coming together in the universe. No, we're here because you have a plan. Uh, we're here because you are uh, the God who is sovereign um, and whose grace uh, um, helps us and guides us and leads us. Lord, speak to us this morning, we pray. Um, renew us, refresh us, as many of us would have come to the service this morning, uh, really, really tired, very weary, perhaps burdened by the circumstances of life, the difficulties of life. And so this morning, as we come to a spiritual hospital, we pray for comfort, we pray for renewal, we pray for strength. Uh, we pray, Heavenly Father, that uh, you would meet with us. And we ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Friends, um, can I just welcome everyone again to the service? Really good to welcome you. Uh, if, if you're visiting with us, maybe for the first time, I know one or two here are for the first time. We have a family from America who are visiting us, and we're delighted to, to have you. Um, family of the Hirschbergers um, and anybody else that's listening online as well. We, we welcome you. A um, couple of notices. Uh, last night we had our, the praise evening. And just to say that last night just under £1,000 was raised for the building fund. Um, and uh, that's, just, that's just absolutely amazing. So we, we're chipping away at the... Um, the, the money that we owe, the loans that we're paying off for the building fund, and that's great news. Um, and so uh, also just a really big thank you for all who were involved with the praise evening uh, last night. I do believe that it gave glory to God. I think these are all the, the notices um, I'm going to mention uh, this morning. Boys and girls, do you want to come up to the front? Oh, there's a... There's a race to get you this morning. Okay, boys and girls, who won? Who got you first? Sam, well done, Sam. Okay. Right, I want to do a little bit of a quiz this morning. And um, maybe the, the, the older boys and girls, well, I don't think we'll need the older boys and girls, but I, I wonder if they um, might help us if we, if we don't know. A little bit of a quiz. So, some, some Bible stories. Tell me some Bible stories that are connected 
worth, I'm going to name a few things uh, in the Bible. Tell me, um, what do you think about when I mention, first of all, fruit? What do we think about when we think about fruit in the Bible? Okay, Fraser, your hand went up first. Um. The fruits of the spirit. The spirit. Yeah. Great answer. The fruits of the spirit. Something else, faith. Um, it's like a good and evil. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Tell me a little bit about that tree. What did God say about that tree, Sam? Um, don't eat it. Don't eat it. What the are the animals on the tree? Don't eat the fruit of the tree. What did they do? They ate it. They ate it. They ate it. Okay, right. The next one, the next item in the Bible was tree. So, we, we've already said, faith's already said. Can you think of anything? If I just say tree, I know that trees are mentioned all over the Bible. But are there something, something things that come to mind, Fraser? Zacchaeus. Sorry? Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, you went up on a tree, yes. Anything else, Jack? The burning Sorry? The burning bush. The burning bush. Excellent. Really, really good. I'm thinking about something else. I'm thinking of Jesus on the cross. Carrying the cross on his back. Carrying the cross on his back, yeah. And another way that they described the cross was? Tree. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, rainbow. Hands. I want to see hands. Rainbow. Hannah. Flood. It's all about the flood, isn't it? And what did God promise, Jack? That he would never have another flood again. They would never flood the world again. Excellent. I'm thinking now of a donkey. Okay? I'm thinking of a donkey. Okay, Hannah? Um. Somebody want to help Hannah? Faith? <coughs> He's walking on a donkey on palm trees. All right. So Jesus was walking, was, was riding on a donkey, and you've taken the next one uh, away from me, but that's excellent. So where are we going with this? What is today? Sunday. Yeah, Sunday. That's Sunday, Easter. Easter, okay. So something else, Fraser? Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. Why is it Palm Sunday? Why do, we, why do, we, why do people say Palm Sunday, Sam? He, he was on the donkey. And what did they do for uh, faith? Because it was Easter. It was Easter, yeah. Easter was coming. And so what, what's the palms got to do with it? Yeah? It's the palms around the Jesus on Easter. Yeah, okay. So they had palm leaves, didn't they? And they held up palm leaves and they worshipped Jesus on the donkey. Where was Jesus going on his way to what place? Sam? <laughs> Jerusalem, excellent. And what was going to happen to him in just a few days' time, Fraser? He was going to die on the cross to save us from our sins. He was going to die on the cross to save us from our sins. Okay, so that's great. Okay, so that's what we think about at this time of the year. We think about where Jesus was going. He was on his way to die on the cross. And it was God's plan and it was his plan. And he was in on the plan. And he knew exactly what he was doing. He was going to die on the cross for you and for me. You guys have been great. That was good fun, wasn't it? Excellent. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you that he came to die for us on the cross. Uh, and we're reminded, Heavenly Father, that he is a king. He is the king, the majestic king, the all-powerful one. He is the ruler of our lives if we put our trust in him and he also came um, humbly seated on the back of a donkey lord we thank you for our young people we pray for them we pray that you would uh, minister to them today and speak to them through your word and we ask it in jesus name
for his sake. Amen. Excellent. Thank you. You can go back. And if we can just get uh, the next slide up there. Okay. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Excellent. Let's sing again. We're going to sing in Psalm number 47. As the children go out, Psalm 47. All nations clap your hands and shout. Let joyful cries to God ring out. If we're able to, let's stand to sing. All nations clap your The, the young uh, people go out. Just, to, just a reminder for the community groups, which is in a few Wednesdays' time, but there's some booklets there. I've got some new booklets. If you don't have a booklet, uh, Christian Beliefs by Stephen Eyre, and they are on the table uh, as, as you go out there, if you haven't got one of those yet. Let's uh, turn to God's Word. And Luke and chapter 19, we've been doing a series in Luke, um, we, we, we're jumping ahead to the triumphal entry 
uh, for this morning. But I'm going to read from verse 11 of Luke in chapter 19. This is God's word. While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable. Because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king, and then to return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten miners. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, Sir, your miner has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied, because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your miner has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. And another servant came and said, Sir, here is your miner. I've kept it, laid it away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow. Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I could have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, take this miner away from him and give it to the one who has ten miners. So they said, he already has ten. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has will be given more, but as for those who have nothing, even what he has will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be a king over them, Bring them here and kill them in front of me. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you untying it, tell him, The Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked him, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an, an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Amen. Pray God's blessing on that reading. Friends, shall we pray again? Just where we are, we'll bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our our young people. We rejoice, Lord, that um, Lord, you love them, you care for them. Uh, Jesus said, bring the little children to me. And as some of our uh, older young people come together for lunch today, Lord, we pray for them. We pray um, for Willie and Rona hosting. We pray for those who uh, will be speaking and being there with them. Uh, Heavenly Father, we pray, yeah, just that you would be in amongst them. We pray that 
uh, that would be a, a time of, of um, kindling friendships, a time of uh, joy, um, of, of good food. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the, the time of praise that we had last night. Um, thank you for, for all that was sung. Thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you for the truths that are behind what was done last night. And we pray, Heavenly Father, for each person who came along last night. Uh, we pray for those uh, who perhaps came downcast. And we pray that today they would be lifted up. Uh, we pray for edification. <clears throat> we pray for those who did not know you. We pray that eyes would be opened. We pray that um, the, the risen Lord uh, would come into their lives. Uh, Father, we thank you for um, those who are well known. Uh, we, we pray for, for Kate, Princess of Wales. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for, for her composure, for her courage and um, in, in speaking about her cancer diagnosis. Uh, Lord, we pray for herself and her family. We are reminded uh, that illness comes, uh, Lord, to, to, to everybody. There is nobody that is immune, Lord, to hardship and, and difficulties in their lives. Uh, we live in a broken world. We thank you that you are making all things new. We pray for that family. We pray for Kate. We pray for healing. Uh, and we pray, Lord, that you would uphold them as a family and, and strengthen them. And, Lord, we know of those who are amongst us who are going through uh, times of treatment, times um, of, uh, of grief maybe, times of difficulties. And we pray, dear Father, that you would, that you would lift us up this morning as we focus on Jesus, uh, that you would renew us and strengthen us. Um, and that we would come away with a real sense, uh, Lord, that we are safe in your arms. Bless us, we pray. Continue with us. We ask it in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. Amen. Friends, let's sing again Psalm, uh, Psalm 118. Um, Throw wide the gates of righteousness. I'll enter and give thanks to God. And if we're able to, let's stand to sing.
his steadfast love endures always. Let's turn to uh, the Bible, to God's Word, and Luke in chapter 19, <clears throat> and verse 30, Jesus says, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. Well, we might say that Easter is a time of uh, opportunity, a time of, of opportunity. Uh, it seems to, to get earlier and earlier every year. Um, you go into aisles, and so it seems that the aisles uh, with Easter eggs get bigger and bigger and more and more. And so opportunity, when we think about Easter, some might think about big retailers who are able to increase their profits. And there is an, a sense in which we buy into that, don't we? Who doesn't like chocolate? Uh, we buy into the idea, and we are consumerists at heart. But Luke would remind us of another opportunity uh, at this part of his gospel, of the opportunity to see the unfolding radical plan of God's redemption of God's rescue plan for sinners like you and I. Uh, remember that word uh, redeem is uh, we're taken into the, the imagery of the marketplace of slave traders, of slavers being bought for their freedom. And that word is, is, is used a lot in the Bible, the, uh, the buying of, of, of the freedom of slaves. And that's what we think about when we think about our own lives, our own Freedom that is bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. And it is the blood uh, through, through which we are bought. The blood represents not his, his life, but his death. But we know that he rises again. And this morning, we've come to church on this morning of March 24th. Many will be tired. Many will be wary of the difficulties of life. If you're a Christian here this morning, it's tough. It's really, really difficult. The challenges of life, if you've got a family, you know the difficulties that come your way every single day. And there are times in which we wake and say, well, I don't want to get on with this anymore. It's really, really tough. And so what's the antidote to that? Well, the antidote, and so Luke's antidote would be reflect on Jesus Christ. Reflect on God's rescue plan motivated by love through Jesus Christ. And that is the balm that you need for your souls. And, and to be honest, there is nothing else that will, that, that will strengthen us and revive us. Like what Luke suggests in the person of Jesus Christ. Look at the triumphal entry this morning. And I want to notice four things of this great rescue plan of God. And first thing that we notice here is that there is a plan. There is a plan. It is, it is God's plan. And it's important to remember that the coming of God's Son on earth wasn't heaven's plan B. Um, it wasn't as if God suddenly had to make a hasty decision because Adam and Eve sinned at one point in, in Eden. Oh, I, I, I better make a plan B. I better do something about this. All right, let's get together. Let's form a committee and make a plan to rescue the world because something has happened that we weren't, that, that we, that we weren't prepared for. No, this, is, this rescue plan was, was, was something that was settled in eternity past. It was settled in eternity before there was ever a creation. The coming of the Lamb of God was foreordained before the foundation of the world, 1 Peter 1. For he was the lamb slain for the foundation of the world. Jesus, we're told there, after he had said this, he went on ahead, giving, uh, going up to Jerusalem. And he gives instructions to his disciples. And they tell us two, maybe three things. They, they tell us, first of all, that he has knowledge of the future. He knows what is to come. He has knowledge of the future. And, and, and secondly that there is his control of events surrounding his death. 
And if we can just, just ponder that just for a moment. That he is on his way to die on the cross. And he has control over the events that surround his death. This is Jesus who is fully human, fully God. This is Jesus who, who, who suffered and, and went through all the difficulties, difficulties of life, who understands what it is to, to live in this life. But he was God as well. As one person put, Jesus is directing the sequence of events that led to his death. And there's something else here. The, the, all, all four gospel writers, they, they mention the tri they speak about the triumphal entry. Luke doesn't uh, quote uh, scripture in the Old Testament much, but he alludes to it. There's a heavy appeal to scripture. And as one person put it, it supports the idea of divine design in these events. The, these this, this, this historical occurrence of this person getting on a donkey, riding up to Jerusalem, it could be anybody that's doing that. And yet we know that something great was going on here. <laughs> that we know that something extraordinary was going on here. There was more to what you see here going on. And God was working out his plan. <laughs> the story of a, a family going camping, pulling into the campsite. Three children jumped from the camper van and, and frantically began unloading equipment and set, setting up the tent. Mother and daughter set up the stove while the boys ran around gathering firewood. Watching on a nearby camper remarked, this is amazing. How did you train your family to work like a team? And the father responded, oh, that's easy. No one is allowed to go to the bathroom until everything is set up. <laughs> and I, I'm not sure it's, it's the best of plans. But, but each to his own. And, and that's, that, that's not to minimize the, the great plan that we're thinking about. That God had a plan that he was working out. That mean for, for us that God has a plan. We, we long for acceptance, don't we? We, we long, uh, particularly... If we haven't met Jesus, we, we long for some sort of order and security in our lives. Some of us will be longing and, and, and looking for these things all of our lives and we'll never find it. That's the reality. For acceptance, for order, for, for, for meaning, for purpose. And, 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 and there are many people who will never, ever find anything like that. But others will. We, we, we try and, and cultivate these things. But, 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 but they will. Whatever we try and do. Looking for meaning. Trying to cultivate meaning and, and purpose. And acceptance. And all these things. But they will ultimately prove elusive. And it's only through Jesus Christ. That we find true acceptance. Order. And stability in our lives. It doesn't mean that everything goes hunky dory in our lives. But but these things that we long for, it's only through Him. Uh, I listened to a testimony this this week of of a person who was searching and, and was heavy into to new age worship, into the occult, into tarot cards and the use of energy forces, and it was in these things that she was, ultimately, she admitted afterwards that she was looking for some sort of meaning. She thought that she would find something that was, that was good for her, that, that brought purpose, and thought that she was gifted at something. Ultimately, that turned out to be evil. She was looking for love and stability which was elusive for her at the time until she met Jesus until she met Jesus Christ 
God said a remarkable thing to the Israelites when they were in the grip of oppression in Babylon. They were under a, an oppressive force. And he said to them a wonderful thing. I, I promise you because of my love for you, not because of anything about you yourselves. He said, I promise you that I have a plan for you. A plan not to harm you, but to do you good. And so God is a God of plan. He has a great plan. And what about the person of his plan? Well, we see quite a lot actually about the, the instrument that he uses to bring about his great plan of salvation. We, we notice here in the story that uh, these cloaks, people take off their cloaks, and we know from the other gospel writers that they have um, palm branches, and they put the cloaks on the floor. Uh, much as a red carpet functions today with a celebrity going up to the whatever it is, they would go on a red carpet. And it's much the same idea back then. And we, the two things that we learn about this person, God's instrument, first of all, his majesty. There's a bit of background here to um, a king getting on to a donkey or, or, or a mule or the like. Uh, there's this idea of majesty, um, this kingliness. Jehu, if you know your Bible, Jehu in 2 Kings in chapter 9, he has this sort of regal accession and he climbs onto a donkey. And we have Solomon's procession to Gihon in 1 Kings in chapter 1. Uh, he rides on a donkey. And so there is this Old Testament background that Jewish people would have understood as they were waiting for their Messiah. And there we see in verse 38, blessed is the king. This is the disciples who, who, who initiate the, the praise. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. We sang Psalm 118 there. And that is where that is from. And, and by referencing Psalm 118, the disciples are saying something. They're declaring that Jesus is the sent king who comes with authority given by God. That's what they're declaring. He is the one who has been sent into the world. He is the king who is to rule over the lives of his subjects. And he now has authority over all things. And so do we see something of his majesty here? We, we saw something in a very far more limited sense in the, everything that surrounded the, um, the, the funeral of the, the late queen. It's very regal, wasn't it? The pomp and the ceremony. And nobody looking on without any knowledge of the queen having died would look on and say, well, that was just a, an ordinary person. And those who were in the new who saw this person getting onto a donkey more than 2,000 years ago would have an inkling of his majesty. And the disciples knew that he was one who had been given authority by God himself. That is why they quote Psalm 118. And they begin the worship of their Savior. But we see not only his majesty, but we see his humility. He gets on to not a great massive horse steed. Have you seen have you seen these Arabian horses that are just magnificent creatures? And you look on and say, wow, what a creature that is. Well, Jesus got into an animal that you think, wow, that's not a picture of majesty. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really a picture of, of weakness. He gets onto this colt, this donkey, this is a picture not of a Messiah, of raw power, but of humility and service. I love the way that 
Kate, Princess of Wales, announced her cancer diagnosis this week. She showed great courage, didn't he? And there was an element of humility there after all the, the rubbish that had been spoken about her. Humility. I wonder, as we reflect on the person of redemption, I wonder what he means for you this morning. Who is Jesus to you? Is, is he the game changer that the disciples suggest that he is? Does he change the game for you completely? Or is he just perhaps a convenient leaning post when the chips are down? Okay, Jesus, I'm going through a tough time. Can you help me out of this hole that I'm in? Or perhaps he's just a moral teacher. Yes, I believe in Jesus. I believe that he, he lived. I believe in the historical Jesus. But he was, he was a man of wisdom and he taught us great things. And there's so much that we can learn about the teaching of Jesus. He was a moral teacher. Well, we've all heard of what C.S. Lewis says about that. Let me quote it just to remind us. C.S. Lewis says, I'm trying yet to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. That's Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. We have a choice. Who is Jesus to you? And then we notice here the people. And interestingly, when we think about the people that are surrounding Jesus at this time, interestingly, Luke is the only gospel writer to mention that the source of the praise is the disciples of Jesus. And that's not only the, 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 the 12, the 11, or 12. That, that's a, a larger group of disciples because very often we had a, a larger group of disciples, followers of Jesus. And they are the catalyst for the crowds praising him. And, and, and this is quite an important detail because it explains how a few days later the same crowd can urge that Jesus be crucified. You see, they, they, they follow us. Very often we, we, we follow the sheep, don't we? Uh, uh, somebody says this and we would just follow along with what's being said. The disciples begin the praise of God and the crowds of followers, they, 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 they follow what's being said. But later on, just a few days later, they baying for the blood of Jesus. Isn't that interesting? Their praise of Jesus is lukewarm and follows the lead of others, other more sincere followers. The popular masses are always fluctuating in their understanding of Jesus. The disciples praise him, and yet there is this group called the Pharisees that so often they are rejecting his claims, aren't they? Verse 39, some of the Pharisees, the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And notice the irony of what he says next. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Jesus declares that if the disciples did not speak out, creation would speak out. Creation would speak out about the glory of Jesus. They would worship him. Inanimate objects have a better perception of what God is doing than do many people that Jesus came to save. I wonder this morning as we reflect on, 
this great plan of God. Where are we in the crowd? Who are we in the crowd? Are we the disciples who see something? To be honest, it's, it's not complete understanding of who Jesus is, but they see something of his glory. Do we see ourselves as one of the disciples who, who lead the praise because, because you know he is the Son of God and that he lives? You know. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Or are, are you one of the Pharisees who reject God's loving offer of grace in your life? We have a choice. I wonder this morning, have we chosen wisely? Acceptance, acceptance of him leads to great blessing, while rejection leads to great pain, doesn't it? It's a great plan of redemption. We've noticed God's plan. We've noticed his person. And we've noticed the people around him. Let's notice lastly that there is peace for those who accept him. And isn't it beautiful how Luke shows us the heart of Jesus as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city he wept over it. It reminds us, doesn't it, of Jesus at the graveside of Lazarus, his friend. He weeps. He weeps because he hates death. But here he looks on to a people who had rejected his grace and he wept the heart of Jesus. He weeps over Jerusalem. They have rejected the peace that Jesus offers and will now face judgment. I wonder, believers, do, do we show the same compassion and love to a lost world? Do we think, well, they've, they've finished, there's no hope for them, or do we weep over them like Jesus? But to those who believe, Jesus says there will be peace. John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do, do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. I give you my peace, Jesus says. I give you my peace. And the peace that Jesus gives is, of course, it's not absence of trouble. You become a Christian, you think, well, all my, all my troubles, all my difficulties are going to go, go away. No, that's not what Jesus promises. He promises us peace. But rather, the confidence that he is there with you always, that he will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus says, I am with you to the end to his disciples. What about the cost of peace? We think of Jesus on the cross. Do you, do you think that Jesus had that same peace when he died at his death? And the answer to that is, is that he didn't have peace. He didn't have peace when he was on that cross, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. We're told that he uh, sweated drops of blood. Take this cup from me. I, I, I don't want this cup, but not my will, your will be done. Take this cup from me, let it pass. You see, he wants God's will to be different. He asks, could there not be some other way, Father? that they can be rescued. Is there another way that this, this plan of redemption could be brought about? One well-known theologian said this, for a moment he stands with the millions of his people who have found God's will almost unendurable, shrunk from the work given them to do, shuddered at the prospect of the race set before them and prayed that God would change his mind. Those times in the quiet of the morning where we cry out to God, God, is there any other way that this can happen? Why the pain? Why the misery? Why the suffering? 
I believe in your sovereignty. I believe in who you are. Father, is there another way that this can happen? And the question that arises then is, Jesus, why is he so, as one theologian puts it, why is he so discomposed leading up to the cross? And we can contrast the way that he is between his discomposure and the composure of thousands of his martyred followers as they face the prospect of sure and certain death. We think of somebody like Diedrich Bonhoeffer, who was executed in Flossenburg concentration camp in April 1945. And the camp doctor, who didn't know who Bonhoeffer was, he watched him take off his prison garb, kneel on the floor and pray. And he said this about watching Bonhoeffer. He says, I was deeply moved, he wrote, by the way this unusually lovable man prayed, so devout and so certain that God heard his prayer. And we've seen that in, other, in, in, in mature believers, haven't we? We've seen them facing grief. We've seen them facing the cancer battle. We look on them and we see composure. We see peace. We see rest. We see a contentment and we say, wow. And yet Jesus cries out, is there any other way, Father? And as this theologian said, he said, why then is Jesus so distraught? It can only be because he is facing more than martyrdom and more than death. You see, the death of Jesus was far more than anything that you and I will face. And he faced that because of his love for you. He went through that for you and I as individuals. Do we believe this? Do you believe it? And have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? God had a great plan. His great plan because he is a God of order, brings order and security. And his instrument was the person of Jesus Christ. Do you know that because he lives, you can face tomorrow? And what about you? Who are you as, as you watch Jesus on that donkey? Do you praise him? Do you seek to glorify him with your life? Or do you reject his grace? The wonderful peace that we are given. Think of the words of the hymn, I serve a risen savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he is always near. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. Can you say these words? Can you say them for yourself? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that Jesus lives. Thank you that he reigns. Thank you that he is alive. Father, minister to us, we pray. Speak to us by your word and by your spirit. Open the eyes of the lost. We ask it in your name. Amen. Amen. From heaven you came. That's where we're going to finish off. Helpless babe, from heaven you came, helpless babe, entered our world, your glory veiled, not to be served, but to serve, and give your life that we might live. This is our God, the servant king. He calls us now to follow him, to bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the servant king. Last night, we almost lifted this roof off uh, the beams. Should we try and do it? to finish off.
Let's sing to God's praise. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. Amen.